So if we may have your attention, please. Just need a button. Hello. Ooh, that works. <laughs> we are honored to have our featured speaker here this evening, Dr. Paul Quinton, PhD. He's a professor of biomedical sciences at the University of California, San Diego. At the age of 19, Paul discovered that he had cystic fibrosis. Soon he began focusing his intellect and energy on CF and started a scientific journey to defeat the disease. At one point, using himself as a subject, Dr. Quinton discovered the basic chloride channel defect. His work has clarified how CFTR functions and how its defect leads to various aspects of the disease. Among many recognitions he has received, Dr. Quinton was awarded the CFRI Professional of the Year Award in 2007. He currently serves on the faculties of the University of California, Riverside, and UC San Diego. So please join me in giving Dr. Quentin a very warm welcome. Thank you, Thank you very much. Is this on? Can you hear me? OK. I was promised that they would dim these lights a little bit. Can we dim the lights? I don't want them to see me. <laughs> I can't see you at all. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> Can I buy you a drink? Um, actually, I don't know what I'm doing up here. Because. Um, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. I've given a lot of lectures and I've given a lot of scientific talks and, and usually with that sort of thing you have data and your results and interpretations. But this is something else. That, uh, where's David Suhu? And Carol Jenkins got me into. And the first thing I want to tell you is I have to disavow the title of this talk. Anybody know what the title of it is? Yeah, <laughs> it's about as formal as I am. So as you see, I, can, I really got uh, dialed up for you guys tonight because I do want this to be pretty informal. And uh, I guess one of the things I can say is, well, okay, I'm 67, I'll be 68 in, in September. And <laughs> But my favorite store is Forever 21. And um, sure don't feel like 68. But when I go into the bathroom in the morning and look in that mirror, and I pinch that thing and it hurts, I think, damn, another day, we got it. <laughs> no, um, there is a lot to getting old that's not so pleasant. And uh, <laughs> I hear some sympathy back there. <laughs> Was that you, Jeff? <laughs> well, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think what this, what this evening proves, though, is that if you hang around long enough, somebody's going to notice. And so, I, I want to say, really, though, this is one of, the, one of the nicest honors I've had to be asked to say something that, I don't know, might do some good. I hope it does a little good, because there's a good probability it's not going to do anything, but I don't know what. Uh, so, if it looks like I get in trouble up here, somebody come up and help me. So... Um, all right, so what I would like to do tonight, let me, let me say also that uh, I think David and Carol had a little bit of help here. How does this come on? Okay. From Isabel Stenzel. And because as I said, when they asked me to do this, I didn't know what to, you know, what to do or what I should talk to you about. <coughs> So Isabel was kind enough to send me a list of questions to kind of guide me, you know? So I'll let you look at those for a, 
a few minutes and uh, a few seconds. <coughs> and uh, I think after you finish reading them, where is, where is Isabel? Is she here? Ah. All right, well, she's not here. Anyway, I think after you finish this, you'll agree with me that she's pretty nosy. <laughs> so, but what I'm going to try to do is maybe address these questions as I go along and talk about a few things that have happened to me along the way. And I'd like to try to kind of divide this talk up into uh, maybe three or four parts. And I first talk about uh, inspiration to me. And as I started thinking about this, you know, who are the people that really mattered or did things that sort of changed my life or, or set it in motion in one direction? And as I began to think about it, there are a couple of people, but the list keeps growing and growing and growing. And you, you know, I can't help but come, come to the conclusion that, you know, this is all about people. This is just all about people. And I don't care what Mitt Romney says. None of us do it all by ourselves. You know, it takes a village. It takes lots of people. So what I'd like to do is just give you a couple of insights into things that, you know, and one of the questions he asked me was, well, how'd you get into science and how'd you do your diagnosis and that sort of thing. And so this guy, you probably, I doubt very seriously that any of you know or have heard of him. His name is Guy Harrison, He's MD, doctor. He's there in that picture. He's 91 years old. And there he is up in the corner teaching, teaching kids about bugs. Because he says, these kids these days don't know nothing about bugs. <laughs> and... Uh, Dr. Harrison is the one that started my formal life with cystic fibrosis. And so my diagnosis took about uh, 19 or 20 years. Because when I was born, I, was, I appeared to be a relatively normal baby until I was about a year old. And then my mother says, I got a lung infection that just wouldn't go away. I got a respiratory infection that just wouldn't go away. And uh, that introduced me to a pediatrician who followed me for a number of years. And I must say, if you calculate this back, this is 1944. Cystic fibrosis had just made the medical literature. And only shortly after that was it shown to be a genetic disease. So CF and I go back about the same, same time. So I saw Dr. Qualtros as my pediatrician for the first number of years of my life. And he diagnosed me with chronic bronchitis or chronic bronchitis, and he told my mother that, well, he's just going to have to learn to live with it. And so that's what it was like. I mean, I had uh, lung diseases, and my mother, she was always very concerned about getting colds and that sort of thing, although she had no idea what, the, what was going on because we didn't know what cystic fibrosis was. Hadn't heard of it. But she was damn good with Vic Sav. Any of you know what Vic Sav is? Yeah. <laughs> Man, I went to school more times smelling like a eucalyptus tree <laughs> than you can imagine. <laughs> and she had this little boiler thing, you know, you put water in it and it gets hot and steams. She'd dick out a couple of teaspoons of Vic Sav, throw that in there, pull this sheet up over my bed, put that thing in there, and there we breathed. <laughs> Eucalyptus trees. <coughs> so that was my lung therapy as a kid. And I guess I was kind of lucky because most of the other mothers in that time treated their kids more or less the same way. So to go to school smelling like a eucalyptus tree wasn't all that unusual. Although I did it, I think, more than anybody else. But in any case, um, as, I got, uh, as I got older, um, I had this chronic cough. I was always coughing, coughing. And I used to go squirrel hunting with my dad. And he came back one evening and said, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that boy. Because we go out squirrel hunting and he doesn't cough a bit. And so, uh, but anyway, I, I think he was just kind of pulling my chain. But um, 
I didn't stop coughing. And so then when I was in the fifth grade, you guys who are approaching my age will remember the old mobile TB units. The x-ray machines, they'd come by to schools and they'd take a picture and then they'd send you a little card saying you're okay or you're not okay. Well, the first time that thing came by and they sent me a little card, it says I was not okay. And so that brought all kinds of hell down because uh, tu tuberculosis in the 50s was a bad thing. And so I thought they were gonna ship me off to some sanitarium and you know, it was, it was pretty, uh, pretty frightening. And uh, so they had all of my, my brother and my, both, and my sister, the three of us, tested. And my brother turned out to be positive with the Tyne test, not me. So that, that finally got resolved. But in the meantime, that threw me into contact with my first pulmonary physician, old Dr. Jenkins. And he ran the TB clinic in Harris County, Texas. And so I saw him for my pulmonary problems. And by the time I got to be 16, actually, actually between the time I was in the fifth grade and the time I was in the, about the ninth grade, I managed to be sick every day that that mobile x-ray scene came to school. <laughs> but then they sneaked it in on me on the ninth grade. And there I went again. Okay, so we go back then. And the pulmonary specialists at that time decided, well, you know, we might be able to make this better if we take out part of the deceased uh, tissue. So they resected my upper right lobe. <clears throat> so that was fine, okay. I mean, I got over that. It hurt, hurt quite a bit for a little while, but, you know. And then I got, um, got off, went off to college. And lo and behold, I got out, and when I got into college, well, it actually happened a little bit sooner, but when I got to college, I really kind of got interested in the girl. And so, you know, you start thinking about those sorts of things, and I thought, well, you know, what is this thing called? bronchiectasis, which is what they had diagnosed me with at this point, is bronchiectasis. Then it was bronchiectasis in the upper two lobes. And uh, so I decided that, well, if, you know, this, this love thing might be serious, might better find out what's going on here if I can. So I was a sophomore at the University of Texas, and I went to the, <laughs> who is that? <laughs> who is that? <laughs> So, uh, software at the University of Texas. So I went to the library with the medical section and I started reading and I started reading about bronchiectasis and lung disease and I read and read and came across this one paper uh, or text and it said, had a footnote at the bottom of the page that said, see in reference to cystic fibrosis. So I flipped over and I started reading about cystic fibrosis and I started kind of getting this chill down the back of my, my spine because all these symptoms were just boom, 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 boom. But the one thing that didn't quite work was they said that the average uh, life expectancy was about seven or eight years at that, at that point. And so, um, so I went back to Houston, I saw Dr. Jenkins, I said, look, Dr. Jenkins, I think I've got this disease called cystic fibrosis. And I remember he looked across the table and he said, you don't have cystic fibrosis. People with cystic fibrosis are dead by the time you're that age, this age. And I said, well, look at all these symptoms, you know? All these characteristic things, upper lobes, belly aches, high salt. You know, I said, well, if you're really concerned about it, I'll send you it over to see this friend of mine who runs a, a cystic fibrosis clinic. Where'd my slide go? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> and that was Gunyan Harrison. Gunyan Harrison was a pediatrician in Houston. He had come to Houston in the early 50s to take over the polio clinic. He was a respiratory pediatrician. And in those days, polio clinic consisted of a series of iron lungs. I don't know if you all know what an iron lung is, but it's not a very pleasant apparatus, but it did keep a lot of people alive. And so he migrated from the iron lung as polio became less and less of a problem to taking care of respiratory patients. And that, that uh, evolved with his residency with a guy named Bill Spencer into taking care of cystic fibrosis patients. And he took a lot of his training from taking care of cystic fibrosis patients into taking care of, of polio patients into taking care of cystic fibrosis patients. And he, I think he was one of the real pioneers in beginning the pulmonary therapy for CF uh, patients. He did some things which were really tough. You know, he tried the bronchial lavage stuff, which 
didn't work too well. We had these, the tent therapies going around all over the place, and those didn't work so well either. But he really was a pioneer. And he had a, had a little laboratory they, he ran, and he had a biochemist in it and a, a bacteriologist. It was in that laboratory that they defined mucoid pseudomonas. And so and they found that the, 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 the mucoid part of pseudomonas is made of alginate. And even at that day, the idea occurred to them that maybe they could control this with phages. So they were working with phages as a, as a, a tactic to try to knock down uh, the pseudomonas bacteria. And that's just recently become kind of a new idea, so-called new idea. <coughs> but anyway, so, so, so Dan Jenkins sent me over to see Guy Harrison. And I walked in and I said, I think I got cystic fibrosis. And he said, yeah. <laughs> I said, well, let's see. So he did a sweat test and left me in this room. And then about an hour he came back and he did another sweat test. And he left me in this room. And then about another hour or so he came back and he did another sweat test. And obviously he didn't believe his eyes. Because the third time he came back, he said, yep, looks like you got it. <laughs> and I said, well, how long am I going to live? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> but um, from there, for the two summers thereafter, he offered me a job in his laboratory. So I worked as a summer student uh, in Guy Harrison's little lab there. And uh, I, I met people with cystic fibrosis, and you know things began to get sort of solidify for me about what was going on. Or, what I was going to do. And I was, at the time, I was an English major who was a pre-med. So I was, I was going to be Dr. Zhivago and, and become a, a, a physician that wrote poetry. I still want to write poetry. <laughs> and so I got into medical school, and I was so tickled and everything, and I came running into to, to Dr. Harrison's office, and I said, I got in. They're going to they accept me in medical school. He said, you what? <laughs> Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? So you spend one day in Ben Tob in the emergency room, and you pick up a bug, and you're going to be dead. <laughs> he said, you don't want to be a doctor. You want to be a scientist. And so I, <laughs> I wasn't ready for this. He said, I know this guy across the street over there at Rice University. And uh, Dr. Harrison was at Baylor at the time. That's where we were. The so Rice University is across the street in, in Houston from Baylor. He said, I know this guy over there in biology. Why don't you go over there and talk to him about becoming a scientist? So I went over and I talked to Bill Philpott, and uh, sure enough, he had a place for me in his lab. And the nice thing was that if I went to work with Bill Philpott, the government was going to pay me $6,000 a year. And if I went to Baylor or to John Seeley, I was going to pay them six or $8,000 a year. So the economics kind of, you know, <laughs> you can see that. And I thought, well, I'll do this, and then if I still want to go to medical school, I'll, I'll go to medical school. And obviously, I never did. So, so I attributed Gunyan Harrison uh, to Gunyan Harrison being the, really the guy that, that inspired me and that really gave me the direction to, to take the course that my life has led over the last 40-some uh, years. And uh, he's a great guy. He's 91. He just stopped teaching these guys how to fly fish because he says he can't cross those plowed fields without a cane, and he ain't using a cane. <laughs> so, but uh, anyway, salutes to, to Gunyan. All right. I'm really glad you guys did that because he when I talked to him last week, he says, now you come back and you tell me what those guys did. And I'm going to tell him that you guys gave him an applause. <laughs> That's terrific. That's terrific. No, I'm sure, I'm sure his, his head be this big now. <laughs> okay, so, so Gunyan really set me on the... the, the the path to science. And then as I was, uh, I, I went to the University of, uh, University of Cal uh, California, UCLA, UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. 
as a uh, postdoc, and I spent uh, several, uh, several years there. I joined the faculty, and then I got a real job at the University of California, Riverside. And th during those years, I, I spent a lot of time working out a technique to be able to what we call microperfuse the individual sweat duct. And I wanted to work on that because that was the one organ that I could see that was not torn up by the pathology of this disease. So if you look at a, a lung uh, from a patient that's died of cystic fibrosis or CF pancreas, you know, the tissue just doesn't leave you much to, to deal with. The sweat gland, however, escapes the morphological changes. It escapes the pathology, but we know that the defect is expressed there because the salt is always high in the sweat. So the question was why? And so I decided to see if, and, and, and fortunately I had, I worked for people that sort of gave me a free reign and let me, let me try to experiment and, and work things out as best I could. It took a long time. But we did um, manage to microperfuse the, uh, the sweat duct. And um, I, I, uh, I guess it was in 1981 that a paper was published by um, um, Mike Knowles and Rick Boucher and uh, John Gatesy and a couple of other people on that, in which they did the first electrophysiology in cystic fibrosis by putting, putting electrodes up people's noses and measuring what the electrical potential was. And they did that kind of accidentally because they were using the CF patients as controls against asthmatics. And lo and behold, the CF patients turned out to be the abnormal ones. And so there they had a basis of a much increased potential, which they attributed to too much absorption of sodium uh, chloride. And when I read the paper, I thought, oh my god, I've been scooped. But then I kept reading, and I realized that they were interpreting this in terms of increased sodium absorption. And for me, that didn't make any sense at all, because we know that in the sweat duct, it's not increased absorption, it's decreased absorption. So how do you explain this? So there I was with my, my sweat duct, and I had learned to, to perfuse it, but I didn't know how to measure anything. And I was trying to measure it electrically with isotopes, but the isotope for uh, chloride is, is, is not uh, specific, or not hot, hot enough, not concentrated enough, so he, in those small volumes, you can't do it. So I had this technique that I've been working on for about uh, five or six years, maybe even longer. And then this guy, can, can we have the, yes. Maurice Berg. Maurice Berg, Jack Orloff, and Jared Grantham were a threesome, a threesome that went to the NIH during the, during the Vietnamese War, Vietnam War. So they did their military service at the NIH. All three of these guys were interested in, in renal, in kidneys, how the kidneys work. And the kidneys, as you may know, is made up of millions of little tubules. And those tubules are about the same size as the sweat duct. So they designed a little apparatus that allowed them to microperfuse individual tubules from the, uh, from the kidney. And I adapted that to microperfusing the duct of the sweat gland. So I had this thing, but I, I didn't know how to, to measure what was going on in the sweat duct so that I could say, okay, Rick Boucher and, and, and Mike Knowles are right, or they're wrong, or it agrees or it, agrees or it doesn't do, uh, agree. And so I was invited to go to, uh, I don't remember if I was invited or I invited myself, but anyway, I went to Belgium. <laughs> to the European uh, meetings, and I gave a little talk there, and I had a paper, and I was talking, and, and Maurice Berg was the invited speaker. So he was the plenary speaker, and he was there, and I was telling him about my work with the sweat duct and how I disagreed with, with uh, Rick Boucher and, and those guys at Chapel Hill, and that I, you know, I've been trying to measure the flux of chloride and, and sodium with isotopes, but I couldn't do it because it, it wasn't hot enough. And he said, well, why don't you do it electrically? Why don't you do it on the basis of what we call diffusion potentials? And I'm not going to explain the, the electrophysiology out of that. But that one single remark changed my entire career. Because then I, decide, I, I realized that I had to become an electrophysiologist. 
Not that I ever really became one, but I really tried. So, <clears throat> so I went back and we started, uh, started designing the system so that we could measure things electrically. And lo and behold, as it turned out, we showed that the problem in the sweat duct was an impermeability to chloride, that chloride cannot get out across the duct, cannot be reabsorbed back into the blood, and so it winds up on the uh, uh, surface of, this, of the skin. So that's, um, those are the two people that I really think I, I owe the most to in terms of what started my uh, scientific uh, career. But as I said, this is a people's game. And there are a lot of people that I don't have pictures for here that uh, were intellectual shoulders that, uh, that I stood on. And just to name a few, is Paul de Saint Agnes, you know, who found the high, high concentrations of salt in the sweat. Harry Swachman, who probably knew more about cystic fibrosis pathology than anyone in the world, certainly until his death. Uh, Sidney Farber, Martin Bodium, Beat Hardorn. For the first two of those, those are guys who really put it together that this was a disease of mucus and really started the puzzle of how do you have a defect in chloride permeability that winds up sticking up mucus in all of the, the organs and causing the, the pathology of the disease. Beat Hadorn was the first person to put together that this was a problem of bicarbonate. And as some of you know, that's been my song for the last, well, too many years. <laughs> I think we're getting somewhere with it now, but anyway. Also for John Eisenberg, who is the same thing, and then Kinzo Sato, who was sort of my competitor and a really uh, a terrific scientist who gave us, gave us a, a cyclic AMP activation of CFTR. And most people don't remember or know that, but that was one of the primary achievements of research. And I just learned this week that Kinzo died two years ago. I didn't know it. I mean, he passed so quietly that it was just, it's just still astounding to me. So I'd really like to give a, a tribute to Kinzo because his work was really fundamental to so much work that's come since 1984. He's, uh, he really, he deserves, he deserves every bit of that and much more. And so, but um, anyway. All right, so those are my, sort of my, my scientific parents, and then there's the intellectual shoulders of the people that have gone on before. And then, you know, you can't do this stuff. I don't think you can do anything unless you have a really good friends. You know, you gotta have friends and you gotta have colleagues. And so, what's going on here, I think? There. Anybody recognize this guy? Well, he's been one of the best friends anybody could have ever had. He's also been a terrific colleague. And uh, so, as you know, Jeff has worked very hard in cystic fibrosis. He's made an incredible impact on understanding the, the glands that are in the lungs that contribute to this disease. And uh, he's also had a lot to say about the clinical care of patients with cystic fibrosis, and I think he's dead on right. And on top of that, in 1995, I had uh, an invitation to go to Chile to give a plenary talk to the Latin American Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I got down there, and uh, I think it was Scandi Farm at that time, had a big dinner for us, and they served a lot of red wine. And I drank a couple of uh, glasses of red wine, and it's got a lot of histamines in it. I went up to my hotel room, flopped down on the bed, and had a major, major hemoptysis. And so I really came, came close to the edge. I was really, I really thought I was gonna fall off. So uh, when that, that put me back here at Stanford, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a, in a minute, but I just wanna thank Marlene and Jeff both because they really, when I was here at Stanford, they were the base. And after they let me out of the hospital, I stayed with them for about, I don't know, two weeks. It probably seemed like two years. But uh, they were really terrific and have always been terrific friends. So I really thank them too. Now, I think 
There's something else that I gotta say that's a little bit different maybe. And I really have taken a lot of inspiration from people in general. I mean, I don't know the people, but just because they were there. And I'm gonna tell you that the people of Texas, the people of California, and the people of the United States. And I'll tell you why. Because in Texas, the public educated me. I went into the University of Texas. The public basically paid for that. Okay? I wouldn't have been anywhere without, that, without an education. In California, they not only continued to educate me when I was at UCLA, but they gave me jobs at the University of California, Los Angeles, University of California, Riverside, and University of California, San Diego. Now, the latter two are really very personal and very important and make me extremely appreciative to you guys. Because you're all, well, all of you are Californians and even those of you who are not Californians. Because when I was at the University of California, Riverside, I moved there in early uh, 1980, I think. Yes. And, at, you know, everybody knows that Riverside is the smog pit of the world. It is, you know, they have the worst smog of just about anybody. That's gotten better in the last couple of years, it really has. California has improved its standards a lot. But, what am I doing here? Oh, Jesus, I'm taking up a lot of time. Uh, you haven't had to call me off here yet. You may want to. But anyway, I want to, I want to tell you this, because I think this really speaks to our university system here. So I said in 1995, I went to Chile and I, I collapsed down there with this major hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is bleeding from the lung. It's a major artery broke. And just to make that a little bit more dramatic, when it broke, I was paralyzed from my neck down. So, and I came here to Stanford to form the, I mean, it went away, but for about 15 minutes, I couldn't move. And so, um, so anyway, the, when, when, I, when that happened and I came back here to Stanford, I went back to Riverside and I realized that the smog is a major problem for people with hyperactive airways. And so the, continuing to live in the smog was just crazy. So I went to my chair and I said, look, you know, is there any way that we could arrange for me to continue working at the University of California, but that I would be in a better, uh, better environment? And they went to bat, and they arranged for me to come to the University of California, San Diego. So the chairman of, the, of the pediatrics at uh, San Diego and the chairman of biomedical sciences at UCR and the chancellors and the vice chancellors said, okay, we'll let you do a change of duty service. And it's for that reason that I am still on the faculty at UC Riverside and on the faculty at UC San Diego. So, I, you know, I don't know that there, there would have been many circumstances or many institutions where that would have been possible and where people would have really supported it. But they did. And I, I think I'm alive today largely because of being able to get out of the smog. Now, I would have had to leave anyway, but I mean, to be able to do it this way was really, really something that I will be forever uh, grateful for. So thank you all for having a great university system that has a heart. So um, USA. Was the USA, the people of the USA that pay the taxes to the government that pays for my grants as, as, as well as the Californians that pay for my salary, so, you know, the, the, the government, the NIH, supports an awful lot of cystic fibrosis research. And, you know, I thank God that uh, we have a government that has this kind of a program that allows us to do this kind of work. And it's your taxes, their taxes, in Idaho and Massachusetts and Texas and Oklahoma that, that does this. And, you know, and I, I think we really need to be appreciative of it. It's a a major, major contribution to humanity. And so for me personally, I, I really am appreciative to all of these groups of people. It's great. <clears throat> well, there's one other person here that I really have to thank. 
damn good looking woman, isn't it? <laughs> That's my wife. And uh, I have to confess, I mar married her for her looks, <laughs> but not the looks she gives me now. <laughs> no, uh, Elizabeth is a really super special person. And so, um, as it says there, she's a physician, she's a hospitalist at Scripps, and uh, she takes pretty damn good care of me. And she has, you know, I don't know what I would do without her memory. Well, I don't know what I would do without some of her memory. <laughs> the other parts of her memory, I wish it would just, <laughs> you know about that, huh? <laughs> but, uh, no, she's, uh, she's the love of my life, and uh, she's uh, just, you know, incredible support. She's really hard to live up to because she's a compassionate physician takes her, her patients uh, very much to heart, tries to do the best she can for all of them. It seems like she's always in a war with somebody who's not, she, who she thinks is not trying to do that. You understand this, huh? As Dr. Hardy's been there. <laughs> and so it's hard, to be a, 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 it's hard to be a physician or a doctor these days. It really is. It's a tough, tough job. There's all sorts of competing uh, uh, forces. So, Here's to you, Lisbeth. Tough woman. I must say, she's also made a lot of a lot of sacrifices on my on, on my behalf that uh, I I'm sure I don't appreciate nearly enough. But okay, now uh, my slides are somehow out of order because I wanted to tell you a little bit about a little bit about more about uh, growing up and getting the. Uh, uh, cystic fibrosis, because uh, Isabel wanted to know how did uh, my parents treat me, and then uh, how did my friends treat me, and uh, how did I feel about it. Well, let me tell you that my parents treated me mean. They gave me spankings with a belt, and my mother was very fond of a switch, and she said, I know that this will not do you any damage, but you will remember it. Yeah. <laughs> any of you ever been switched? These days, yeah. <laughs> It hurts. You re yeah, after that, you start thinking about, well, what do you have to do to avoid this outcome in the future? <laughs> so, but no, my, my parents were really, they, you know, neither of my parents were very, very well educated. And uh, my dad worked for what is now Exxon Mobil. And they put me through high school and all that sort of thing. And uh, my mother was a housewife. And she was very good, as I told you, with Vic Sav. <clears throat> so, you know, they just accepted, accepted me as a kid who had salty sweat. And my mother was very irritated at the fact that my shirts would rust the coat hangers and, and get rust stains on them. So that was her biggest complaint, other than the fact I, my dad thought I coughed too much. <clears throat> but he also smoked, so he... <laughs> so anyway, so how did I feel about CF whenever I found out that I had CF? I mean, I always knew something was wrong with me, but it... It really never kept me from doing uh, uh, very much. Um, when I found out that it was cystic fibrosis, I, I didn't know what to make of that. I really didn't, because this was a, a life-shortening disease. It was very clear, and I had no idea whether I was going to be living six months or five years or, you know, who what knows, because Harrison wasn't telling me. And so um, my first reaction was to keep it quiet. You know, I went home, and I... I, I talked to my parents and, you know, and they didn't know what was going on really, it didn't make any sense to them. And so I told, uh, I told my professors, Dr. Philpott, Dr. Tormey at UCLA, that I really would like to keep this under the table, and which I did for a number of years. And I guess, I don't know, it's hard to figure out why I, was, why I did that. I guess it's because one, I didn't want to be perceived as being different. Two, I didn't want to cause other people to be uncomfortable because, you know, if you've got a fatal disease and you're walking around with people, it reminds them of their own mortality and it makes them a little uncomfortable, you know? And the third thing was I didn't want people to kind of feel sorry for me and to give me something that I didn't really deserve just because they felt sorry for me. So I thought, well, the way to handle this is just keep it secret. 
But eventually it came out and I told a, a really best, my best friend, I said, you keep it quiet, but I gotta tell you this. And so that happened several times. And, I, and then finally some reporter got a hold of it and it was in, up here as a big article in the San Jose Mercury. <laughs> and so then the cat was really out of the bag. <laughs> So now I'm completely out of the closet, as you can see. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, it makes a difference, but it doesn't make a lot of difference, I guess. You know? So what keeps me going? You know, what motivates, what's the positive things? Well, when I was working with Gunyan Harrison in the CF clinic there, I met a little Latino boy, a little Mexican boy, he had a very pretty mother, and he was just as cute as a bug. He was about uh, three years old. His name was Pancho Escamilla. Pancho Escamilla. He had the biggest smile you've ever seen, but he had cystic fibrosis, and he was dying with cystic fibrosis. And so he was there in the clinic, and we were doing chest therapy. You know, those were the, the pat days when you'd hang them by their heels and beat them this way, and hang them by their other heels and beat them the other way. And he would cough until his jugular veins would swell up and you'd think they were gonna burst. But he was just, you know, a really cute kid. And I really liked him. And uh, of course he's died many, many years ago. And I don't know what happened to the, I actually don't know what happened to him, whether they went back to Mexico or what. But, but that, you know, Pancho, Pancho didn't know what he was doing, but he was doing something that was very important. And he was influencing me. You know, he was making a difference in my life. And in, in essence, what he was doing is teaching me that I needed to be needed. And I think that's probably one of the most important things that we can learn, is that we need to be needed. And then when we find what it is that we can do to be needed, to do it. And so I don't have a picture of I don't have a picture of Pancho, but I have a picture here of another little girl. It's taken not too long ago. I know some of you will recognize her. But you can see she's got the world in her hand. And I think we'd like to give it to her. So that's one of the things that sort of keeps, keeps us going, keeps me going. And... Um, uh, What else? Well, all the other people that I, I've mentioned, you know, my wife, she certainly keeps me going, and my friends and my colleagues and the history behind all that. And I guess another thing that keeps me going is curiosity. You know, what, what's gonna happen next? What are we gonna do? What's tomorrow gonna bring? You know, you gotta stay alive just to find out what's happening tomorrow. What are we gonna do? The other thing, the other thing, though, is, you know, as a scientist, and I don't think that this is something that's exclusive to scientists. You know, I, I think, and I heard something like this the other day, is that humans are evolutionarily evolved to discover. That we are the species that is hell-bent on finding something out new. And you think about it, you know, Every time you, so, you find something new, whether it's for yourself or for the whole world, it gives you a thrill. It's an incredible amount of, of, of pleasure in making a discovery. You know, even if you're here walking in the redwoods and you cross the hill and you look over and you discover this incredible panorama, you know? And they say that's related to endorphins. You know, when, you, when that happens, your endorphins are released and you get this big thing that says, Probably as good as sex. No, I don't know. But <laughs> better. <laughs> You're not the first one to say that. <laughs> so, and I, you know, I can, I can tell you the few times when I have seen something that I, I thought hadn't been seen before, it is just such a, a glorious uh, feeling and pleasure. You know, it is. And, you know, I think that extends to everybody. Just, you know, the idea of, Having curiosity, pursuing a puzzle, finding the answer, making a discovery. So that's one of the things that, that kind of keeps me going. 
How much time we have here? Anybody got any questions right quick? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Well, let's see if there's anything else. I was going to talk about some health habits and that sort of stuff, but maybe you want to do there. I think I'm going to skip over that, though. I really didn't realize that this was going to get into me so much. Um, I will say a couple of things about, uh, about health habits, though. And uh, Dr. Hardy, you correct me if I get off on the, too far on the, on the limb here, but I have what I call my canaries in the mind. You know, you know what a canary in the mind uh, is? So you go down to the coal mine or wherever you are, you take this canary with you, because canaries have a very high meta metabolic rate. And if the oxygen gets, starts getting too low or the toxic gases get, start to, getting too high, Canary dies, and that means you better get out of there. Okay, well, you know, and, and this is me, okay? And I, and I am not a typical cystic fibrosis patient, okay? So I don't want you to run out of here and say, oh yeah, this guy is 68 and, you know, not, nothing to worry about. Um, but, and so what I do doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be applicable to everybody, but I just thought I'd just tell you these things um, in case that, you know, you might find them a, a little bit useful. And one thing I'm going to say is that the sinuses, I think, are great canaries in the mind. The sinuses are part of the respiratory system. And I know that every time this sinus on this side gets stopped up at night, that something's going to go on. And invariably, if I treat that with hypertonic saline inhaled, it will disappear and it will, not, it will stay fine until I be a bad boy and stop taking it for a couple of days. And it comes back. So I think that the, the sinuses really tell us a, a, a good bit about what kind of a therapy we're getting and what it's, what's going on. And invariably, when that thing swells up like that, I've got mucus accumulated uh, in, in a uh, biofilm form that with the si hypertonic saline releases and it's, you know, it's better. The other thing is to, you know, and this is gonna sound a little gross to you because nobody likes spit. You know, I don't know what it is, but everybody's abhorrent of spit. You see spit on the sidewalk and you walk on the ground outside of the speed, street. But CF patients have a lot of spit, yeah? And um, most of us just swallow it and go on. Sometimes uh, I spit, especially when, I'm, when, when I don't think anybody's looking. And the reason I do that is because I want to see what it looks like. Because there's information there. You know, the color of it. And one of the things that's extremely important is if you start seeing a little bit of blood, a little streaking of the sputum, that says that you've got a hot spot, that there's some spot in the lung that is, is, is infected, inflammation is up, and the, the capillaries or the blood vessels are rupturing a little bit. So it's time to, time to pick up and look around and see what the hell's going on. So that's another canary in the mind. Another is just cough. How often do you cough? What's the frequency? You know, somebody said that CF patients cough 600 times a day. I don't know if it's quite that much. I don't think I quite cough that much, but it's quite a few, probably 300 easily. So, but paying attention to how much you cough, how deep you cough, you know, what does the cough sound like? Does it change, does it change uh, uh, its resonance? And if we live with it, whether you're a parent or a, a CF patient, you get to recognizing these things and you, you start noticing when the changes are and it can be a pretty good uh, indication that move on. So, um, dehydration, that's a threat to CF patients but not so much here in California because nobody sweats. Well, that's not true. If you live off of the coast, you do sweat. I know because I lived in Riverside and I sweat plenty there. So yes, uh, people in the desert areas have a big threat for dehydration. So what's the canary in the mind? Well, for me, I just look at my fingers. And if they start looking a little wrinkled at the tips, it means that I'm dehydrated, all right? And then if they start cramping a little bit, it means that I'm even more dehydrated. And then if I stop peeing, I better do something. Because one of the first things when you're really dehydrated, you stop peeing, okay? So just little, little things to know about little things that you can use to maybe avoid a, a little bigger catastrophe that uh, at least I found useful. So what am I afraid of? What do you fear? 
That's a really difficult question. I don't know. Michelle Bachman? <laughs> I think so. I think so. It does. Anyway, I guess I could add a couple more to that list, but I, I, I'll stop there. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I, I really am not afraid of too, many, any, too much of anything, I think. I mean, I do get scared if somebody points a gun in my face. I'm sure my adrenaline's going to go up through the skis. And if, you t if, you, if I go around the corner too quick, uh, the curve too fast, and the car starts sliding off the road, my adrenaline goes up, yes? And it really goes up with my wife, <laughs> who says that I should be a lot more afraid of a lot more things. So, but, uh, no, I suppose that that question is uh, addressed to something to do with death. No? And... Am I afraid of death? Am I afraid of dying? I, you know, I don't know. I certainly am not as afraid of it as I was when I was 14 and discovered that I was going to die. I mean, that was kind of terrifying at that point. But now it's, you know, I don't know. I think uh, I've got a, a much different perspective on it. And I, I guess that I can look back and I can say that you know, I've lived with this all my life since I found out that I had CF. I mean, I didn't know it was two years, five years, or whatever. And it, it's not all bad. It really is not all bad. And when I look back at it, I can think, I think I can look you honestly in the face and say, death is an inspiration. It is, it can be really inspirational. Because it drives us to life. It drives us to live. You know, if you, go, if you ignore it, I think you lose something. And so I think that, you know, the threat, the challenge of death, is something that can inspire us to be more than we would have been otherwise. You know, death will inspire us to, to live, to love, to give, to get, to have, to hold, to build, to break, and to kick butt. So I told you I was an English major, and I would like to close by just reading you this poem. Is that okay? This, this poem is by a contemporary poet, Philip Larkin. I like him. It's really sophisticated. It's called The Mower. You know, the lawnmower. The mower. The mower stalled twice, kneeling, I found a hedgehog jammed up against the blades, killed. It had been in the long grass. I had seen it before, even fed it once. Now I had mauled it, its unobtrusive world, unmendably. Burial, burial was no help. Next morning I got up and it did not. The first day after death, the new absence is always the same. We should be careful of each other. We should be kind while there's still time. I'll leave you back. Sure, if you have time, I mean, it's... Time for just a couple questions. Raise your hand. You have a, a question for Dr. Quinton? Yes. Oh. Is it Sally? I'm just curious as to what you use for airway, airway clearance. What do I do for airway clearance? Okay, you know what this is? Yeah, it's a milk bottle. Okay, you know what a spacer is? You know what this is?
That's what I do. That's one thing. So this is the way, this way we take uh, prednisone steroids for uh, uh, Dulera or Simbicort. And I show you this because this is just a plain old plastic, plastic bottle. But you've got to go to the pharmacy, you're going to spend 15 bucks on this or maybe 30. Yeah. Okay? And this is all you need. I mean, this is just about the right size. And it's important to do this properly. Okay? Because what most people do is, particularly the asthmatics, they poke it in their mouth like this and punch it and try to breathe. Okay? First place, you've got to be incredibly coordinated to do that because it needs to go in to the, all of the airways. And so it's important to breathe to what we call vital capacity, full inhalation. So you start way down at residual volume, that is as far as you can get the lungs to collapse, and then you punch this thing in here, and now you've got a spray mist that's distributed in a volume, and as you inhale that, it goes throughout the airways uh, more evenly. I won't say completely evenly, but more evenly. And that's extremely important because not all of the airways, especially in a diseased airway, open up at the same time. So when I start, first start breathing in, some of the airways will open up and the gas will go over there. And as I get higher and higher in the, in the inspired uh, volume, more airways will open up and the, and the air will go there. So if you just do this, it's all going to wind up in one place. Or it winds up on the back of your throat. And that's the problem with this thing is that these things don't give a really good distribution of particles. So for inhaled, uh, for inhalation therapy, it's important to have the full excursion of inhalation, that is from residual volume all the way down to vital capacity all the way up. And it's also important to have particles that are gonna go out to the distal parts of the lung. So if this thing puts out particles that are 10 microns, that doesn't mean anything to you, but unless you're, unless you're into microns. But it's, those are relatively large particles. And they come out, and it's like if, if I ask you to shoot a bullet down a tube, if the tube is straight, you can get to the other end of it without hitting the wall. But if I bend the tube, the bullet's going to hit the wall. So these are bullets, and when I put them in here, they've got to go this way, then they've got to go that way, then they've got to go this way, and then they go this way, and that way. They're going to hit the wall before they get out to where they're supposed to be. So you need a particle that's small enough to be carried with the airflow so that it doesn't bang into the wall before it gets to where it's supposed to be going. So that's why I, I really like this. This is the vibrating mesh nebulizer for an E-flow or an Altera or a Trio or whatever the hell they're calling it these days. I mean, I've never seen a, a same device be called so many different things, <laughs> dependable. And so, so this, this works with a, a vibrating mesh. And it's really a beautiful invention. It's got a little disc in it that's been drilled with, by lasers so that the holes in the disc are, are very small. They're small enough so that whenever it throws the, the liquid out, the liquid will have a relatively uniform particle size of less than about four microns. So in order to get a good distribution of lungs, you need something that's generally less than about five microns. So three to five microns is a good range for the particle size to be in. And so this guy is, I think, beautiful for that. And so this is what they give you. They give you some other little thing you can stick in your mouth and, you know, it's just terribly inconvenient. But I also use this gadget. This is another Quentin invention. But this is just a rubber, rubber cork, rubber stopper from the lab with a hole drilled in it and a little plastic tube stuck in there. And the reason I do that is because of this lecture I was giving you about canaries in the mine. I know this is gross, but... And I put this in here, and I can really treat the, the sinuses. It really works extremely well. So you try putting this in your nose, you can do it, but I mean... It's, I use hypertonic, yes, I use hypertonic saline. And uh, that works. I've really become a believer in that. I really have become a believer in... And the reason for that is because, I, I, I'll, let me just finish with this, last, with this last little analogy, okay? I know this is going to sound corny as hell, but I think it really makes a point. What happens to you if you don't take a shower every day or every two days? Yes, <laughs> that's right. And I guess, 
I guess you're going to tell me why you have no friends. Yeah, because you start growing bacteria. Okay. Well, the problem with CF lung is that it grows bacteria a lot faster than most lungs. So this thing gives it a shower, I think, every time we do it. It puts a hypertonic saline in down, down in there. It irritates the lung. If there's secretion, it causes more secretion. It acts as an osmotic force so that it draws fluid into the lung. And there are probably about six or seven other things that it does that we really don't appreciate as well now, but they're theoretically very possible. And for me, it has made a, a terrific difference. It really is. I, 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 I am religious about this. So what do I do for airway clearance? It's, it's hypertonic saline in this. If things get really bad, then it's airway uh, antibiotics or aerosolized antibiotics like colistin or something of that, that sort of thing. And when I get the opportunity, I like to ride a horse. And I do ride a bicycle most every day. So anyway, all right. Thanks for letting me be your hook. Oh. <laughs> Presentation honoring this uh, year's Heroes of Hope, a program sponsored by Genentech. So I'd like to introduce Aaron Levine from Genentech. He's here to speak on behalf of the Heroes of Hope program. Can I have Aaron join me up here on the stage? This is on? Yep. Okay. Hi, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, my name is Aaron Levine. I work at Genentech. And um, I started working in, at Genentech about three years ago in sort of the respiratory area, working on cystic fibrosis as well as, as another area of, of respiratory therapy. And, um, and, and after getting involved with the cystic fibrosis community and meeting a lot of folks, some, a lot of whom are here, um, as quickly as possible, I tried to sort of absolve myself of that other side of what I was working on in order to dedicate myself to, to CF, which is what I've been doing for the past two years. Um, it's just such an inspirational community here with, it's, it's unbelievable, with people working together from, um, from patients and caregivers and advocates and physicians and centers and industry, and it's, it's, it's really amazing and inspirational to work with. Is, you know, as, we, as, we've, as we've just heard from Dr. Quinton. Um, <clears throat> but I, I wanted to thank uh, Carol and David for, not only for having us here today, but just for everything that they do, everything with hosting this conference, a real milestone at 25 years. And uh, for everything they do with CFRI throughout the year, and, and also for the support that they give to the Heroes of Hope program. And they've done that for a lot of years, and they get the word out on, on what is this program and, and, and who are the recipients. And it's, it's, we're, we're very grateful for the, the work that Carol and David and CFRI do. Um, so in terms of Heroes of Hope, which is, you know, over the last few years has been somewhat of, a, of an online event, um, why do a live recognition event like this? And I think it's really just to take advantage of this great opportunity to be in front of so many members of the CF community and, and show how grateful we are to the community and, and how grateful we are to you. Um, 
And, and we just felt it was a unique opportunity to share this update um, with this live audience. So in terms of Heroes of Hope, um, I should give a little description. Or, or how, how many in the audience are familiar with the Heroes of Hope program? Yeah, you four, probably. Um, all right, so over half. All right, not bad. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a description. This is a program created eight years ago by Genentech, and it was designed to bring hope to the CF community by highlighting individuals with CF who are role models, who are inspirational in the community through their dedication to proactively managing their health, uh, being adherent to their therapies, and, um, and, and recipients are nominated by, really they can be nominated by anybody. They can be nominated by family, by friends, by members of the CF Center. Um, and, then, and then the nominations are voted on by a, a panel of six people. And these six, the panelists, uh, none of whom are from Genentech actually, they're all members of the CF community in terms of patients, caregivers, advocates, healthcare providers. <clears throat> so they, um, they do a majority vote on who's going to become the uh, recipient of Heroes of Hope in a particular month. And, um, and, and the nomination form is, is now really easy, by the way. You can just go to heroesofhope.com and nominate somebody through the online mechanism there. It's very, very simple. Um, so what we're here to do tonight is talk about um, heroes and, and what they've been up to since they were recipients of the Heroes of Hope. Um, and so up on stage tonight, we have some of our past heroes, and we're very thankful that these folks were able to, to make it here to be with us tonight. So we've got our past heroes, Paul Quinton, as we just heard from, Dan Legassi, Michelle Compton, and Carrie Sheehan. And Carrie's here to share an update on Maggie Sheehan, now Maggie Williamson. And um, so Dr. Quinton has really set the stage already today with his talk, and, and I'm very thankful. And I remember when when I was helping to run the Heroes of Hope program a few years ago, and he became, he was, he was um, uh, with the, the recipient of this, I was just utterly inspired, and, and now just hearing your talk today was a whole nother thing, so thank you. Um, but, uh, you know, so thank you very much for joining us up here today, Dr. Quentin. And since we've already heard from Paul, um, I wanted to give the other heroes um, an opportunity to speak and to tell us what they've been up to since they were the Heroes of Hope recipients. And um, so the first person I'd like to call up here to uh, say a few words is, is our Hero of Hope, Dan Legassi. Since I became a hero of hope, um, I continue to travel. I forget whether it was before or after, but I've been to about 40 countries. I was hospitalized in eight of them. I learned a lot about hospitals all over the third world. Um, but I also had a love for old cars, and so with my wife's permission, I bought a 36 Ford and um, tore it all apart. Learned how to do body work and bend metal. And it wasn't my line of work. In fact, I was a pastor. But um, I totally restored this 36 Ford since I was nominated as a hero of hope. Um, if it didn't break down last week, I would have driven it up here tonight. But anyway, it's, uh, it looks nice as long as you don't start it. My wife and I uh, celebrated 20 years of marriage. And so uh, we went to Cabo San Lucas and spent a week. Down there, we also took a cruise in the Mediterranean, which was a, a dream of mine. So um, I'm grateful for that award, and uh, it's great to live an active life. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And um, I'd like to introduce our Hero of Hope, Michelle Compton. Um, invite her to say a few words. been a long time since I became a hero of hope, so there's a lot of water under that bridge. Um, and I haven't traveled to all the 40 countries like Dan, but I've done my share, and I continue to travel cross-country. 
So um, I've been to a lot of different places since 2004. And I continue to work with Breathing Room, so I'm still doing a lot of that. And as Darlene said earlier, we're really excited to have all the images compiled into a book and have that published. And then just recently, we moved from the peninsula and bought a house up north of Petaluma and have been able to do that in our living uh, our goal is to live off the grid. We haven't completely succeeded in that, but um, we're going that way. So that's what I've been up to. Thank you, Michelle. And I would like to introduce Carrie Sheehan, Maggie Williamson's mom, and invite her to say a few words. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so sad that Maggie is not here with us or with me tonight. This is the only second time that she has not been with me. Uh, the first year I came alone from Chicago, and every year since then she's been with me and has attended the CFRI retreat, which she just holds so uh, dear to her heart. Um, Maggie is doing well. The only reason she is not here is due to pan resistance, um, and that's only hopefully for this year. Uh, Maggie met the most wonderful man, uh, three years ago. He is a wonderful British boy, and uh, they happily got married last October 1st in San Francisco at Grace Cathedral. And they are currently living in San Francisco, which I'm thrilled for them, breaks my heart that I don't see her very often. Um, but I spent last night with her and her husband, Tom, and I cannot tell you what it means to be a parent and know that your child is so happy, and she truly is. And in two hours, my son, non-CF, Stephen, turns 21 years old, and I think he's really happy too. <laughs> so I just, I cannot tell you how much it means for Maggie to be a hero of hope as a parent, and how much CFRI has meant to our family. Um, I just wanna thank you all very much. So please, let's first toast to these wonderful heroes of hope. Here's your glass. Thank you. And um, I hope that some of you will be willing to tell us a little bit about who are the heroes in your lives, who are your inspiration. Just across the hall, um, we're going to have a video camera, and we would love to just record who's inspirational to you, whether it's family or friends or someone from uh, CF Center, um, uh, we would love to, to record that. And, um, and also, if you wanna learn more about nominating a hero to the Heroes of Hope program, then um, we can tell you more about that um, just across the hall. Or certainly, again, just at heroesofhope.com, you can fill out very quickly and easily the online nomination form and, and uh, nominate someone that's special and inspirational to you. So thank you again to all of you for joining us today. Thank you again to CFRI, uh, to Carol and David for all the hard work that this organization puts in all year round and for this milestone conference and giving back to the Heroes of Hope program. And, um, and, and, and of course, we'd like to thank and recognize our heroes one more time. And, um, To these incredible heroes, past, present, future, um, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, and, um, and enjoy your dessert. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Genentech. Thank you, Heroes of Hope. We have, as you're finishing your dessert, we have maybe just one minute left to go here of our program, and then we're going to let you go. <clears throat> this concludes the evening program. We hope you've been both informed and inspired. Please pull out those pink evaluation forms because if you fill them out now, it'll be a lot easier than trying to remember on Sunday morning how much you enjoyed or questions that you might have about the evening's presentations. So breakfast tomorrow morning is 7 a.m., 7 to 8.30. Time seems to fly, so, so please come early. And uh, we'll have breakfast right here in this room. 
And that is about it. We're now going to invite you to head over to Puzzle's Hospitality Suite. That's right in front of the reception desk where you came in and to your right. And uh, you can have some further conversation and refreshments. Good night, everyone. Good night.